Does that work? That's good. Okay. So, yep, time is coming. So I now I'd like to start the ninth I Dream Cafe. And thank you for all joining us, our Cafe Talk. And I'm Hiroaki Diamond from Kyoto University and also the organizer of this cafe. So just as a reminder, please mute your mic before we start. So in this cafe, we will talk about how small organization in Japan and the United States survived the crisis during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would like to briefly introduce the aim of the cafe and today's presenters. So as everyone knows, since 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has spread all over the world, and especially for small organization and small business. Um, it has been a long, painful time to navigate their own business. So here I am showing the number of the small businesses in the United States. And this chart showed that the number of small business since 2000 and in the first quarter of 2020, 3.3 million small businesses decreased, which reaches 20% loss. And it is the largest drop in American history. And this clearly shows how big the impact of the pandemic is. However, different statistics in Japan also shows an interesting aspect. And this chart shows the number of bankruptcy of small and medium sized enterprises. And how do you think the number increase or decrease in 2020? And interestingly, compared to the United States, the number actually decreased in 2020 in Japan. So this means that uh, the, the number of the small businesses in Japan was stable in 2020. So how can we interpret these differences? So here in this carpet talk, we are going to dive into the case study in the United States and Japan and try to understand the small business continuity under the pandemic and try to think lesson learned from pandemic. So I'd like to introduce three presenters today, including me. And first presenter is Dr. Yu Matsupala, a researcher, disaster prevention research institute, Kyoto University, Japan. And Dr. Matsupala is a recent PhD in informatics whose main research interests are in disaster mitigation planning from disciplinary perspective of civil engineering, social psychology, and social informatics. And second presenter is Dr. Zachary Cox, a senior business continuity analyst at AmeriHealth Caritas, uh, one of America's fastest growing Medicaid managed care organizations. Previously, he was research, as, research assistant at the University of Delaware's Disaster Research Center where he explored how small organization navigated the pandemic. As a researcher and practitioner, his focus is on creating resilient organization that can adapt to disaster. And third presenter, which is me, uh, Hiroaki Diamond, a researcher at the Disaster Prevention Research Institute, Kyoto University, and I am focused on disaster volunteerism and altruistic behavior that arises under the crisis. All right, let's see if this does it for me. There we go. Okay. All right, yeah, we can see your slide. Okay, can you, is that does that work or should I? No. Oh, yeah, it's a work. Perfect. So good morning, everybody. I am Zach. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Hiroki on, on the project. It looks like uh, Dr. Mastubara is going to present. What I wanted to do today was kind of a pair or talk about a parallel project, what I did for my uh, PhD, and then taking that to the next step, right? And, and expanding on it, maybe launching um, another project off it. I'm calling it Entrepreneurial continuity. I don't know if that uh, that works very well, but it's the working title. And so I'll open up with this, right? We tell everybody 
to prepare. We tell all the small organizations to prepare. We've got stacks of binders of preparedness. Um, and and if I'm if this is my job now, right, is to come up with a disaster con uh, business continuity plan, test the business continuity plan, engage all kinds of different parts of the business, and document. There's a, an issue though when we get to the level of the small organization where where I really like to to look. And small organizations are, well, they're smaller. They have lower financial performance. They have fewer staff. They have less technical ability, uh, right? They're, they're not these huge places where you, you, know, you can go and hire a business continuity planner. But fundamentally, they're more, um, at least in my life, central to community life, right? They're the places where you go for coffee, uh, the local coffee shop, not necessarily uh, Starbucks. Or, you know, when I was doing my dissertation research, I talked to um, like a food pantry, right? Where if you're uh, struggling, you can go get some food. Locally owned, owned, locally run. Um, huge difference between that and the United Way, right? And at these small organizations, I found that nobody really prepares. So when I spoke to Artie, who was a business continuity planner, he told me, you know, that the, there's an inappropriate focus um, among people who want to get prepared on terrorism, right? He said, when I go to a customer, they're all, they, they either say, all, I, I, need, I need some sort of hardening, right? I need to make my, my building or my facilities or my internet or my IT infrastructure in some way uh, less susceptible to an attack. Or they say, you know, 9-11 happened. That was a big building in downtown New York. Um, I'm not worried about it for my coffee shop. Therefore, I don't need any business continuity services. There's also other work to do. I talked to Tracy, who inherited a store from her father uh, when he died. And her father being sick for a couple of years, the store was in, in disarray. This was, I talked to Tracy right before COVID. And she said, I had no preparedness for anything. My store, right, I was, I was focusing on, on resuscitating it, right, getting my inventory levels back up getting some back taxes done, getting, you know, a staff uh, hired to man the register, that kind of thing. And the third big thing that I, I found that discourages preparedness is there's not uh, enough money. So small organizations have different goals, right? They have different priorities. When I talked to Olivia, who owned a coffee shop, she said, you know, pre-COVID, I wasn't worried about preparedness. Um, even if I if I was, I had a big goal. Her big goal was to buy a like a big coffee roaster, right? So she didn't have to get her beans uh, roasted somewhere else. She could do it all in house, uh, really control the process, really offer an excellent experience to her customers. So she had a savings account, but it was it was earmarked for this this equipment, right? To expand her business, to do what she cared about doing, not necessarily uh, prepare. I would add to that some of the research from uh, Dollhammer in 1998 that says there's not very much of a difference between small organizations who prepare and small organizations who do not prepare in their ability to recover. Now, this was a specific example, right? The North Ridge earthquake. But when he looked at levels of recovery across North Ridge, I think it was a year later, he found, you know, it didn't matter if he had a preparedness plan or not. Um, so with that said, there are capacities for resilience, right? Not necessarily things that you plan for, right? Not necessarily things you put in the binder, but having a previous experience with disaster, uh, having a little bit of money, even if it's earmarked for a different project, gives you a little bit of resilience and some time in the community. So when I talk about previous experience with disaster, when I did my uh, dissertation research, I talked to a gal who had spent, uh, when she was younger, in her 20s, she went down to Rwanda after the genocide there. And she had signed up for the program uh, thinking she was going to go teach English as a second language. And she ended up teaching, um, or not teaching at all, and she ended up bearing bodies, right? And for her, that was a fundamental, that was a life-changing experience that allowed her to handle stress, allowed her to handle um, adversity, right? Really unpredictable situations. And so she was able to bring that in, right? That was a capacity for resilience that allowed her to navigate COVID-19. 
So if the existing, maybe this is a little dramatic, if the existing paradigm is unworkable, um, what works instead, right? What, what, how can we get organizations who do not prepare for disaster, who cannot prepare for disaster, how can we get them recovered and how can we get them continuing to serve their communities? And so building on a little bit of what I did for my dissertation, right, we can support, these are the kind of the, the four things that I think really um, would help. Support organizations to understand their purpose, right? Craft a vision, what understand, help them understand what, um, what they do really well, what they care about, why they care about it, and, and double down on that. Um, when I talked to Margaret, who ran a small museum, she said, you know, I had, I had a, a business continuity plan for a train derailment that I wrote at the library 10 years ago. It, it was um, useless, right, for COVID. But she had a vision, right? She really wanted to tell stories about her community. She really wanted to bring people in and connect them to their past, right? She works in a uh, uh, college town and a lot of transient people, right? And she wants to give them some roots. And so when she was pivoting, when she was coming up with ways to get through the pandemic, it was always coming back to that, right? How do I put on an exhibit that people are going to come in for? How do I make them come in in a safe way to get them to understand where they are and give them some sense of place? I think it's important that we also help organizations conduct research in a, in a similar way to how a startup would, interviewing their customers, right? The people who cared about that place before the disaster, what do those customers care about? And through that, they can pilot new programs. Um, I talked to, to, during COVID, I talked to Ken who ran a snack food manufacturer. And he said, you know, I've got, a, he told me, he said, my existing business model is, is tapped out, right? There's, there's not nowhere for it to go. What I need to do is get on with my own private label, right? If I'm just doing uh, snacks for Sub or Safeway or, or Trader Joe's or whoever, that isn't a lot of value add. What I need to do is put my own name on it, snacks by Ken, right? Get your, get your pretzels. And then people keep coming back for that, right? And so he was piloting this new way of working, huge pivot, right? It requires him to have his own e-commerce abilities and uh, move away from contracting out with, with organizations the way he had before. And then adapt the portfolio based on customer requests, based on the new vision. How can organizations come up with new ways of working and new products and new services that meet the post-disaster need. So there are some challenges to this. The, that my focus so far has been on COVID-19. And in the United States and in Japan, COVID-19 was lubricated by enormous, uh, enormous amounts of loans, grants, and aid. So without those loans, grants, and aid, does this process work, right? Does it matter if you have a vision for your organization if you're struggling financially? I don't know. So what I wanna do is some participant action research, right? Which is intense depth, find a couple small organizations, work with who, who have, have just experienced a disaster, work with them very deeply uh, and understand what their process is in order to, uh, in order to recover. Of course, this means a small sample size, uh, but it's a pilot. I also, you know, Hiroki and uh, Damon, or sorry, Damon and you, I really enjoyed working with you on the Japan side. And I want to know, how, how, do I, how do I do that again? So I know it's questions at the end, um, but what do you think? Thank you for your presentation and sort of provoking and it's a nice presentation, I think. And hopefully, yeah, I would like to discuss with you. And also I'm do I also want to do action research and wants to compare the differences between Japan and United States and also differences between um, pandemic and natural hazards also. And I would like to open the open small or quick. Uh, question the comments to the audience and if, if not let's just move on the next uh presentation from dr yumatsubala okay so yep i'd like to invite the next presenter yumatsubala could you say something <laughs> yes make sure okay yeah 
it seems okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sorry for my yeah computer's trouble. Okay. So now I'd like to invite uh, from Kyoto University, uh, Dr. Matsubala. So could you start your presentation? Yeah. Thank you for introducing. I try again. <laughs> Yep. Okay, yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Yu Matsubara uh, in Kyoto University, uh, Japan. My presentation title is Struggling in Unstable Social Norms, Small Business in Japan. So I'm going to talk about the, mostly about the case in Japan. And later on, uh, Hiroaki may uh, compare Japan and uh, United States. Our interview, uh, first, uh, we conducted uh, semi-structured uh, interviewed uh, in 2021 uh, from July to September. So yeah, roughly it's one year uh, ago. We conducted snowball sampling and interviewed 27 uh, small business owners uh, via Zoom. Yeah, this is the interviewees uh, list. Uh, we selected interviewees uh, from both uh, rural and uh, city area and we chose uh, various categories of uh, small businesses. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like you to know uh, the characteristic of Japanese society. Uh, in Japan, uh, the power of government is not so strong compared to other countries. Uh, for example, there was no lockdown and there was no stay home order, uh, but only uh, advisory. And the other, in other way, uh, Wearing masks was uh, not the uh, obligatory one, but uh, mostly uh, voluntary uh, yeah, rules. And uh, yeah, in contrast, people take care of uh, other people. Uh, I mean, uh, people, not a specific person, uh, make implicit social norms. So uh, people take care of how other people think and act, and people sometimes criticize what they think is unacceptable. And yeah, it is sometimes called kind of a police. So uh, we needed to take care, uh, uh, not, not to e only government, but the people make the social norms. And the, uh, this is the uh, contents of uh, regulation by a uh, government. And uh, there were yeah, like a, a several times of a state of emergency, but the uh, content of regulation was different in uh, one by one. So the area of the prefecture in emergency was different, and the uh, contents of regulations are different in each time. So uh, people, and of course, small business owners were very confused in this uh, changing uh, social rules. Uh, my question is, how did the change of social norms under the COVID-19 uh, pandemic in Japan affect small businesses? Uh, I uh, categorized the uh, interview data uh, into the 99 units, uh, considering the contents of the decision and the, uh, when uh, that kind of uh, decision were made by uh, small business owners. I will introduce uh, this uh, table one by one. First, in first time, uh, uh, from January to May in 2021, uh, there is a beginning of the pandemic and uh, in Japan, first state of emergency. Uh, in this uh, time phase, uh, most business uh, suspended. So the uh, most important uh, decisions were uh, suspension of businesses. And uh, there was no clear rules. So, uh, the time when to uh, close business was different by each uh, small businesses. And the characteristic category uh, in uh, some rural area in Japan, uh, although restaurants were not uh, subject to the request of closure at the time, it closed uh, because other restaurants in the area had closed. And uh, this is what a business owner said. Uh, in contrast, uh, there was some uh, development of new business like a, a online tour or a, yeah, making masks and selling it or yeah, that, that kind of things. And in next time phase from uh, June to December in 2020, uh, 
uh, it is uh, the time after the first uh, state of emergency. Uh, in this time phase, uh, most uh, businesses try to resume uh, their businesses. And there was no uh, clear rule or guidelines yet. So uh, each business uh, created uh, their own uh, a kind of effective uh, business rules uh, for, uh, I mean, uh, considering the stopping and uh, uh, preventing a pandemic. For example, uh, uh, seafood sales and standing by in, in Tokyo. Uh, sorry, there are two Tokyos. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, reducing uh, reduced the number of seats to avoid crowdedness. And in other uh, restaurants, uh, voluntary there was voluntary installation of air purifiers. But uh, this kind of uh, uh, resumption could not be done in all uh, businesses. Uh, for example, uh, a shopping street association uh, couldn't conduct events and functions uh, almost at all uh, in 2020. And uh, in uh, some areas, uh, tourism association couldn't do uh, any events because uh, there was not agreement uh, on on what kind of, uh, I mean, rules uh, they can uh, uh, to perform the events. So there was no agreement on uh, how to uh, resume the event. Uh, there was a difficulty, uh, they said. And in a uh, uh, next time phase, uh, from January to August in uh, 2021, uh, there was a second state of emergency. In this time phase, uh, there was a clear rule created by a government. So uh, decisions uh, made within the rules established by the government uh, were a lot. And yeah, only a few number of uh, businesses uh, switched to uh, their own business rules because the uh, rules created by a uh, government was not enough uh, for them to survive. So as a whole, uh, we found, uh, yeah, uh, there was uh, the perverse of three origins of social norms uh, that affected business owners' decision changed as time passes. So uh, for first time phase, uh, people or uh, implicit social norms had uh, almost made uh, small businesses, uh, yeah, close uh, their businesses. And the second time phase, uh, small business owners had the powers uh, to uh, decide what, uh, how to open their businesses. And the, yeah, third time phase, uh, governments uh, made the clear, uh, clear rule, and uh, people and the small business uh, wouldn't have the, didn't have no other way but to follow the uh, government's rule. In Japan, this kind of uh, dynamics was formed. And I want to know uh, how uh, this kind of figure about become in other countries. Yeah, uh, this is yeah all. Thank you. So thank you very much, dear Matsubala. So let's move on to the next presentation. And that is me. So one sec, give me one second. And here we go. So uh, I like to start my presentation in title with a decision making move. A gaming approach for small business continuity using Crystal. And I think this is a kind of uh, response to the uh, Zach presentation, Dr. Zachary Cox presentation. And But uh, I'm going to get into a research topic. I like to explain my background in motivation of this study. Because I was born in rural area in Japan as the son of family owned Japanese noodle restaurant. The last one restaurant was established in 1927, and my father is the third generation to run this business, which means I would be fourth generation if I learned how to make the noodle. But uh, anyway, uh, since the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, my parents has been also struggling in surviving pandemic to adapt the government regulation, as first presenter Dr. Matsubara explained. 
And also, I asked my father, do you have any lesson learned from the pandemic? And, but he says nothing and how to prepare. And I don't know how to prepare for this. I have to respond to the situation as it arises. I guess the only way, he said. So this type of response, the kind of uh, we cannot prepare for that, uh, this kind of responses were also mentioned by many uh, research participants in our research. And actually, the real situation of disasters, not only pandemics, but also natural hazards, preparedness plan fails, especially for small businesses. As Dr. Cox mentions, some scholars argue that planning is not a bad thing, but it is often better to allocate a resource to current problem in a daily business rather than promote the plan in advance. And even non-planning sometimes lead improvisation or promote their capability to quickly adapt to the pandemic. So my question in our research is how we can utilize a lot of insightful interviews from small businesses and how to communicate the lesson the lessons of the pandemic with small business owners. Although previous research said, especially for small businesses, it's quite difficult to prepare for it in adults. And then I went back all of interview records and I encountered the interesting form of the narrative, which were consistent with most of interview participants. The narrative form represent conflicts or difficult difficulties to make a decision. And I will show you an example that Mr. Akiyama, uh, who ran Italian restaurant, explained. And he was wondering that he should continue to buy vegetables or wines from suppliers or stop buying them. Trust between suppliers are stronger than that in the United States. And even in the pandemic, it is still important to maintain the relationships between suppliers. And actually, he discarded half of the food he purchased, even though they ran in red in his business. And he explained he explained why in this way. And I'm going to show you his explanation for that.僕も生きのこるし、業者さんにも生きのこってほしいっていうのがあって、だったら営業してるお店は少しでも取らなきゃっていうのと、僕も and this kind of struggling with decision making were seen in the same way and in a lot of different situations in the interviews. And I picked up similar cases related to the business partners here. For example, Japanese restaurant owner Kobayashi said he purchased a freezer for stocking to continue to the relationship to, between suppliers. And another owner of the fish shop said he wondered whether he broke the request or comply with the request because he if he cannot continue to purchase to fish from suppliers it means their suppliers might not be able to run their business so these are the example only about the maintenance of business partners however this type of explanation uh, whether you should choose a or b and if you choose a from a Because of time limitation, I cannot explain all the type of the conflict, but it is important, especially for small business owners, to face the difficulties to make decisions, uh, which might cause problem in their business. And in Japanese disaster research, 
their new old gaming tools to improve the disaster preparedness, focusing the conflict situation. It is called Crossroad Game. And this game is very simple. And if you imagine you were a decision maker, you would choose yes or no in the question. And actually, I made 15 questions from the interviews. And here is one of the examples. And could you imagine if you were the owner of a fish shop and a standing bar with three employees and 10 part-time workers? And I'm going to explain this uh, question sentence. And various measures have been taken to combat infectious diseases, such as installing partitions, reducing the number of seats, and educating employees. However, the state of emergency declaration has been extended. And in addition, alcoholic beverages, uh, such as beer or something, or sake maybe, will no longer be served. And without serving alcoholic beverages, standing bar cannot operate. And if they continue, if uh, the regulation continue to be, no, if the standing bar continue to be closed, they may be forced to lay off employees or change suppliers. Standing bar are outdoors and the risk of infection is low. So ignore the request and reopen the standing and drinking businesses. And if you choose yes, it means you will reopen your business. And if you choose no, it means you will comply with the request to continue to shut down your business. So I don't open to discussion now, but instead I will show you the real decision, real decision that one of the small business owner made. And he said, Yes, he breaks a rule. まあ、いよいよ、あのー、これは、ただただ、えー、政府の政策というか、あの、要請ですね、に従うことが、えー、まあ、本当にこの社会にとって、えー、いいことかどうかっていうのが、あのー、いよいよずれてきたなという、ふうな思いがそこですごく、まあ、高まってですね。お店を守ること。うん。えー、あとは、お店を支えている、えー、人たちの生活を守ること。えー、仕入れ先の、えー、生活を守ると、うん。っていうことを基準に、えー、しようと。うん。いうふうに、えー、いよいよその、あの、自分の気持ちが固まってきたっていうのは、その、いよいよ要請を破るっていう時にですね、あの、えー、そ,のその決断の、決断を支えていたのはそういう基準というか。So, in this game, we can discuss the decisions and learn from others' decisions, and in addition,、uh, we can learn The real decision that business owners made. So in this case, Mr. Ohashi decided to break the request and reopen the standing bar business, considering the livelihood of employees and suppliers. And this kind of decision making is, uh, represent the Japanese culture to, uh, to think the relationships between suppliers are important. And so I will wrap up with my presentations. And my hypothetical conclusion is that difficulty of decision making is lessons from COVID-19 pandemic. And there is a lot of numerous decision making whether business owners should continue business or comply with the infection measures of COVID-19. Of course, there is no any universal answer. Nor useful answer in advance, but it, it, it completely depends on, and it completely depends on situation, the timing, or their funding conditions and so on. So that's why I think the participant says there's no lesson learned or would be harmful to set the plan in advance. So crossroad game might work well because it focuses on conflict and highlights the conflict among the participants. So it is important to learn about conflict in decision making instead of solid 
static or non-flexible plan in advance, especially for small business owners. So maybe we might be able to say we should focus on the catch-22 situation, not hindsight 2020, now because we are now in 2020. So thank you very much.